so I think we'll get started. Uh, first of all, we are thrilled that you're here. Uh, this is the uh, second think tank that we have done. We've now collected an incredible group of stakeholders from Rhode Island, from uh, Massachusetts, uh, from Connecticut, but mostly from Rhode Island, and then a group of individuals who came from outside of the state who have been sitting, uh, working with us very intensively over the last two days, and we'll introduce them in a bit. But um, just to give you a sense of the structure, we invited them, we put them uh, in a nice place. This, the, this is the house that Ed uh, built, the uh, School of Medicine. Um, and uh, we've been, uh, we told them that you can talk about ideas, we can work through a facilitated process, but at 12.30 on Tuesday, 90 people who are all stakeholders within the patient-centered medical home, within the healthcare system, are gonna come together and you have to present. And it has to be cogent, it has to be pithy, it has to move us to another place. So we'll get into that in a second. But before, I am thrilled to introduce the sixth dean of the School of Medicine and Biological Sciences, Dr. Edward Wing. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Jeff, and I'm really pleased to welcome uh, all of you and provide some opening comments to this national think tank on the patient-centered medical home and practice transformation. Uh, let me first acknowledge the leaders of family medicine, so Jeff Borkin and Chuck Eaton and Chris Johnson and Roberto Goldman for putting on this, uh, this really exciting event. I think it's, uh, it's innovative and creative and uh, it's uh, absolutely terrific, so we really welcome that here. And I want to particularly thank the uh, visitors from around the country who came here. So I know it's a big deal. It's a pain to travel and you, to come for a few days. And so we really, really do appreciate it. We, we welcome you and we, we really uh, think it's, uh, we're honored by having your expertise here. So I want to thank you personally for, for making the effort to come here. Um, <clears throat> so how we uh, transform clinical practices and educate the next generation of physicians is, uh, is really critical. And I'm concerned on many levels. I'm concerned as a dean. I'm concerned as uh, a practicing physician, I, I've always taken care of uh, HIV positive patients for the last uh, 20 years almost since the beginning of the epidemic, but now it's turned into primary care. So most of what I do <clears throat> is primary care, and so I see patients once a week and I'm very concerned about, I've always done that, and I'm, and I'm very concerned about the issues of primary care. And. Uh, and I'm also concerned as a citizen of Rhode Island. Rhode Island uh, faces issues in terms of primary care, delivering care, to do it uh, efficiently and effectively, and so uh, that's a, a third concern of mine. So uh, let me just lay out a couple of things, and I brought some backup material, so I don't usually do that for an introductory talk. <clears throat> but I, uh, I'm a very firm believer that primary care is the essence of uh, medicine that it has the, the essential uh, critical uh, point of delivery of care, of preventative care, and managing care. And uh, it's gonna become even more important in the uh, changing landscape in this country. It's already the, uh, the fulcrum of uh, clinical care in many other countries. And some of my favorite reading material is uh, one of the ones that you've seen this before. This is a book called Healing of America, and it's really a popular uh, comparison of healthcare in developed countries around the world. And the major theme of this is how badly we do things in this country. That most developed countries cover all of their citizens, they stress primary care, and they do it efficiently, and they provide quality care, and they provide it cheaper than we do. So it's a, uh, it's a disturbing book, but it really changed my mind when I read it a few years ago. And I do uh, recommend that book to anybody. The second uh, piece of information I brought is uh, probably you know about this new um, IOM report on primary care and public health. So it's a very interesting report which stresses the uh, intersection between public health, prevention, population health, and primary care. And, and I think it's, uh, it's well worth reading it. Uh, it uh, implores the CDC and HRSA to come together and to start working on the intersection between primary care and public health. So again, I think that's very important. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, Jeff Borkin and I wrote, a, uh, wrote an article, an op-ed for our local paper on primary care. So if you hadn't read that, I highly recommend that piece of, uh, that piece of journalism. <clears throat> but it really stresses some of the things that Jeff and I feel strongly about 
and some of the innovations we're uh, recommending and uh, carrying out in, in this country. And then yesterday I saw some very interesting data presented at a uh, conference on aging. And what it, it just presented some two facts, basically. One was the longevity in the United States, uh, how long people live compared to other countries. And our, uh, our uh, longevity is basically equal to Costa Rica and Cuba. That's how long people in this country live. But the cost of delivering care in those two countries is uh, at the most 1 20th of what we deliver. So if you think that's a quality measure worth paying attention to, and they're spending 1 20th of what we do, something's wrong. <laughs> We're not doing it appropriately. And one of the factors that they do stress in those countries is prevention. So they have a primary care doctor responsible for, for citizens within their geographical area, let's say 2,000 patients. And the primary care doctors go out to the homes of each of those individuals once a year and they assess their medical conditions, their health, their nutrition, the environment. And, and they can pick up things early. It's really preventative care. So that's innovative. We don't do that in this country. So it's, it just struck me of what a difference other countries have made in terms of delivering health care, preventative health care, and then the effect on the citizens of those countries. So, so it's great being a dean. I can get up here and sermonize and say whatever I want, and, and then, uh, but I, they don't let me do it for very long. So, so I'm going to finish up uh, in a little bit here. So I do want to uh, recognize the Albert Medical School. So the Albert Medical School is is uh, very involved in primary care ever since the 1970s. This has been a school which has made that a uh, emphasis. We recognize the uh, need to continue to evolve our own curriculum. Uh, the medical student class is expanding, which is one of our responses to the healthcare provider needs. So we've gone from 96 students to this coming September, we're going to admit 120 students. And part of it is just because of the building. We have the resources to do it. Um, we also know that about half of our class go into primary care fields, but about only half of those go into true primary care. Many go into specialties of cardiology or specialties of internal medicine or pediatrics. So we're providing a lot of primary care doctors, but we're not providing the optimal number. Uh, we continue to innovate our curriculum. So we have an innovative uh, doctoring course, which was set up by a number of people here, including Jeff Borkin. Uh, there we put first and second year students into doctor's offices. So I've always had a uh, student in my, in my practice. They get to see primary care directly, and some of the early influences have a huge difference in what people end up doing. So that's been a very successful program. We're focusing on teaching students to practice team medicine. So just a couple of weeks ago, we had 200 nursing students and pharmacy students from the University of Rhode Island and from Rhode Island College here with our medical students practicing team medicine, and we're going to do much more of that. So um, integrated uh, patient care, interprofessional care that we think is very important. And then finally, we're developing uh, and we're seeing the feasibility, but it's, uh, it's really a go from my point of view of a primary care track in the uh, medical school. So we're this would be on top of the 120 students. It would be 20 or 25 students who would be admitted separately. The focus of the curriculum would be on primary care and public health, that is population health. Uh, these would be people who would be leaders in those fields. They'd be practitioners in those fields. They'd have a separate admission process, separate curriculum. We'd focus it on Rhode Island as well. And so this would be a very innovative program, really focusing on primary care. And so we think this is important for the future and to be important for the mission of the, uh, of the medical school as well. So we're also, uh, we're also, as many of you know, is that we're a small university, not too small, but we're <clears throat> smaller than many universities. We're uh, collaborative. We have a culture here of working together, and uh, so in the university we have some advantages. We're also a small state, so people in the state work together and can work together closely, and that includes our schools, uh, our universities, our uh, public health uh, uh, programs, our uh, state government, our city governments, and uh, the various uh, health functions which relate to them. So the Department of Health, the Office of Health Commissioner, the Governor, and uh, Lieutenant Governor, and you know we're very we're very uh, 
there are not a lot of good degrees of separation in Rhode Island for those people outside of Rhode Island. So uh, I have lunch with <clears throat> whoever, when I, whenever you know, the, the uh, <coughs> spirit moves me, and we can uh, discuss things on a very personal basis. So that's a big advantage for Rhode Island. So I'm, I'm just very supportive of this, uh, of this uh, symposium. I think it's uh, incredibly important. I'm very supportive, uh, both from the medical school's point of view and from a personal point of view. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. And unfortunately, I have other things to do, so I'm not going to be able to stay for very long. But, uh, but I wish you uh, all the best and uh, success in this symposium. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the dean. And actually, this is uh, a special state. Where can we get people from government, people from academia, people from insurance, the employers, the, uh, to come together and to say, we can really make a difference. So that's what this has been about. We've actually, uh, as I mentioned when I uh, started, we took a group of people, national uh, authorities, who uh, had to have three opportunities uh, to come together. We invited them. They had to have the ability to have, be immersed in theory, immersed in innovation, and immersed in the dirt of actually doing this kind of PCMH work. Um, so I think uh, maybe we'll just give a chance for them to stand up and just uh, say who they are. You have their bios in, the, in your packets. So maybe we'll start over here. Great. Okay. Well, uh, so we locked them up for two days. We uh, had a facilitated process, but uh, thinking in terms of parallel process to complexity theory, we knew that we had starting points, but they would absolutely diverge from the plan. So uh, they did. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that they produced was this metaphorical tree that is the soil, the environmental factors, and the fruit. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, but uh, they know that they had an absolute deadline of 12.40 to present. You'll be hearing from three of them uh, who are going to try to pull together what we talked about. But um, that's only going to be the first part, presentations. The idea is to um, move from there to small group work. There will be seven small groups with a uh, person from outside of the state and a local facilitator. There'll be time to discuss some of the questions as they uh, relate to Rhode Island. There'll be a scribe uh, and a presenter from each group. We'll come back. We'll have kind of a laser, very focused presentation from each group of three minutes where individuals will only present th in, uh, material which is new. They will um, uh, then we'll talk about wrap-up and next steps. The goal, making this work in Rhode Island. Um, you have two sets of handouts. You have the bios on those individuals who came from the outside. And you have uh, the slides, which, just to give you a sense of our timeline, we're only finished at 12.05. So uh, we've been pushing that envelope. The outline will be elements of the framework, soil process. Doug Eby will start us out. Uh, preparing the soil, creating the environment. We'll hear about the Vermont example and the business case, particularly the idea of getting hospitals on board from Paul Grundy. Um, and there's a biblical expression, ain nevo iro, there's no profit in their own city, which has been translated to uh, local speak that you're only an expert if you come from 20 miles away. So we're going to start with the person who came from furthest away, uh, Doug Eby from Alaska. All right, the clock's ticking. We don't have much time. So patient center medical home has managed to get kind of the center stage. And those of us who do a lot of primary care and community health and population health have an opportunity to impact the conversation in medical care and the expenditures in health care in this country. And the only question really is, what are we going to do with it? And are we going to actually do something worthwhile with this opportunity? And there's not really any shortage of um, theory and ideas, but what there is a shortage is in actual execution, in producing the product, and taking it to scale, and making it transferable to other places. So that's what we're going to try and talk about a little bit today. Um, the, the diagram is really key. 
pretty much the whole work of the last few days and culminating on the work a lot of us has been doing for decades really is kind of tied up in, in this diagram. So a couple things to talk about here. Uh, you'll notice that, that the usual things that are talked about in patient-centered medical homes, we've called fruit and put them in the tree. So when you talk about what is a patient-centered medical home, what are the elements, and what do people need to execute on and create in order to be an effective um, producer of what patient-centered medical homes are supposed to produce, it's the stuff in the tree called fruit. And the big emphasis that we talked about and sort of the end point we've come to is that there's not nearly enough conversation and investment and emphasis on what we're calling the soil and the environment. So we're going to mostly talk about the soil and environment factors. For those of you who are in the practice of primary care and medical offices, you'll notice that you've been told to do a lot of things that are called fruit. And what we're saying is that in order for those practices to successfully produce fruit, there has to be not just first, but, but concurrently, really good soil development and really good environment, really good healthy optimal environment. And they all need to be happening at the same time with a huge amount of investment in all three of the areas. You also notice in diagram that the central piece the most important essential piece is right in the middle there. It says individuals, families, and communities. Because at the end of the day, we need to be uh, providing something of worth to individuals, families, and communities. It needs to be what helps them succeed in what they're trying to do. And what it says there is accomplishing what's important in their lives. Not what's good for us, not what we think ought to be done, but what's important in their lives. So here's the sort of statement we came up with, that the purpose of the entire system, the purpose of primary care, but also the purpose of the entire healthcare system is this, supporting individuals and families and communities to achieve what is important to them. The definition is decided by the people receiving the services and for whom this journey is actually their journey, not our journey. So improving the health of the population over time is a piece of it. That's in smaller print underneath. And we talked a fair amount about health care and the care part, again, being individual family and community directed, individual family and community driven, and a collection of services that we provide in response to what they want on their terms woven into their lives when, where, and how they want them. Now, if you really do that, that is a radical, radically different thing than what healthcare has primarily done, at least for the last 100 years in this country. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the story where I come from. I come from South Central Foundation. Uh, the system we've created, we call the NUCA system of care. We are Alaska Native, tribally owned and operated, privately owned and operated by Alaska Native people, running a system for Alaska Native people. Our primary catchment population is 55,000, 145,000 people in the larger catchment area that we address. Uh, we started this journey about 15 years ago and have done a whole lot of things that have gotten us attention, including some big awards and all that kind of stuff, which gets me invited to things like this, which is kind of cool. Um, at the end of the day, we are about customer ownership, and our organization is technically customer-owned at the macro level, but also we believe that the journey, the individual and family journey, is a customer-owned uh, environment, where the owner of the journey, the owner of the health issues and the, the outcomes and the goals is the person in front of us, and they deserve to be treated in a way that has the very highest customer service standards. Uh, this is why people listen to us, besides being kind of cool from Alaska. We've managed to drop per capita ED use and hospital days and so forth by well over 50%. We've dramatically dropped visits to specialists, some drop in primary care visits, at the same time increasing health outcomes from generally the lowest fifth percentile. This is an extremely challenged, high-risk, complicated population, and most of our heat is comparable measures now put us in the top 25th, many of them the top 5th percentile after a decade of effort on a completely redesigned platform. Our staff turnovers dropped to 20%. That's one-fifth as much staff turnover as we used to have even just seven, eight years ago. And our satisfaction ratings for people working for us and people getting services from us are very high and sustained over time. Happier people, way lower costs, way better outcomes than a completely fundamentally rethought and redesigned platform. This is a key point. 
In healthcare, we tend to think of doing things to people and for people. And in some of healthcare, the part to the right, that actually makes sense. So in a high acuity situation where the person's unconscious or they're on the operating room table, we're doing things to them. They're passive, we're active. And in those situations, we ought to have really lean and six sigma and protocolized and standardized best practices done to them in a safe and effective way. But the thing is, in the vast majority of healthcare now, the part on the left side of this slide, the reality is, it's not whether we want to give control, but the fact that the people receiving services have the control. Whether they pick up their meds, whether they cut them in half to save uh, money, whether they take them the whole time that they were prescribed for, whether they quit taking them because of side effects or because they feel better, or pull the pills out of the cabinet they took last time because it helped me last time, probably helped me this time. All of that stuff, whether they drink too much alcohol, whether they smoke, what they exercise, what their sleep habits are, all those things are under their control. Not do we want to give them control, but they already do control the variables that drive, whether they get chronic conditions, how well they live with them, whether they decompensate, whether they end up in our emergency rooms, clinics, and hospitals. If that is true, then this is an important thing to understand. Most of medicine thinks that what we're doing are throwing rocks at targets, if you use complexity language. I stand here, I throw a rock at a target. Over time, eventually, I can hit the target every single time because I can learn from my experience. I can be observed by others. I can, I can learn from the best practices. I can be measured and apply Six Sigma Lean and all kinds of other methodologies so that eventually I can hit the target every single time. I'm active. The rock is passive. I exert my will on them. I need to reduce error, do best performance, and protocolize, standardize, and beat the heck out of people who don't comply. And there is room for a lot of that in healthcare. That's why we reduce surgical side infections and ventilator-acquired pneumonias to, to levels unheard of previously. The problem for us, especially in primary care, is the vast majority of what we do is more like throwing a bird. And for the smart Alex in the audience, it's a live bird. So if I stand here and there's a target over there and I push the bird in that direction, I can have some influence. I can send it in the right direction. I can push it with some force. But whether the bird goes to the target is under the control of almost exclusively the bird. The way I can get the bird to go there is to understand what is attractive to it in complex adaptive system language. This means knowing what the attractors are and then building on those, connecting deeply to the bird, and you get the analogy right, so to the patient, the family, the people coming for services, understand what are their values, what are their attractors, and build completely our system upon what works for them because the goal is to get them to the target in an environment where they hold almost all the variables and the control over those variables. Am I making sense? Are we going to get there through Six Sigma and Lean as our primary tools to get there? Not very likely. For those of you who are a little overtrained and academicized to death like most of us in the room, I give you a diagram that says the same thing. Bottom axis, if you're in a low complexity, low variable environment in which there is great certainty about the single best practice and way to do things, then you ought to protocolize, standardize, and discipline the heck out of people who don't comply, meaning providers and other clinical staff. And there's a lot of we do that that ought to be the approach. And again, this is why we've reduced ventilator-acquired pneumonias, post-op surgical sinus infections, and so forth to unheard of levels, because we have learned how to do that well. However, 75% of what we do in healthcare is not that. It's moderately variable, and there's only moderate agreement as to the very best way to go about it. A 50-year-old, new-onset diabetes, you can play out the rest of it. In that arena, the expertise we need to have is understanding human behavior and complex adaptive systems and complex adaptive system theory. Whoops, wrong direction. So here's the reality. Healthcare is experienced longitudinally over time in a context of social, religious, and family, influenced by values, beliefs, habits, and lots and lots of outside voices. The most impressive, powerful person in healthcare is, well, was Oprah Winfrey. Now she's, like, left the stage. But the real system here is this complex adaptive system, messy human relationships in parallel interplay with each other over time. And there is a huge amount of science and expertise around how to get excellence in this type of environment. And we must become experts in this because this is the language of primary care. Way more than mechanical linear manufacturing models and Six Sigma and Lean and that sort of stuff. They're important, but applied to rock-throwing environments. When you're in a bird-throwing environment, they're not the right tools. You need a whole different set of language, tools, words, concepts, and that sort of thing. So for us at SCF, we've said there's four dimensions to the medical home. In fact, four dimensions to healthcare in general, the ability to connect to and define and support a defined population over time, 
That's the new goal. Barrier-free team-based services is the new structure. We need to redefine completely then on that latitudinal platform how we play and interact with specialists and hospital and other institution-based systems. And the fourth dimension, extremely important, we don't even, most of the time we pretend this doesn't exist, but taking already existing infrastructure and services that exist in our communities and piggybacking onto them to the ultimate goal, which is weaving our knowledge, expertise, and services into people's lives on their terms, when, where, and how they want to need them, which means this business of everything going through the doctor before it can go anywhere else in the system, called in chemical terms a rate-limiting step, does not work, is too expensive, and does not produce a good result. We need to understand parallel processing, messy human relationships, attractors, complex adaptive system theory, managing through mentoring and coaching and learning and data and pull systems for quality, at South Central, we've taken this a step further and said there's a whole business to preparing the ground and the people who are active in this conversation. So we put every one of our 1,500 staff through this thing called core concepts. Where we basically retrain them on what the score skill set is they need to succeed in this environment. And for three days, our CEO leads every single one of these sessions. That's how important it is. And we reteach people how to uh, problem solve and be in healthy communications and work effectively in teams and um, give story and receive story in deeply meaningful ways and rehumanize our overprofessionalized workforce to be able to do this work of working with live birds instead of throwing rocks. We then take this further. We've got millions invested now in deep mentorship training. For every three doctors, we have a mentor doctor. For every three nurses, we have a mentor nurse. Same thing throughout the whole system. Huge investment in teaching these people how to get into each other's business in a deeply intrusive and meaningful way that's supportive and helps retrain and retool completely the entire workforce. Then we have a whole lot of other things we do, listening to the customer in at least 10 different ways, active at all time, group hiring, onboarding, training, career ladders, job progressions, the whole thing called the development center, extensive use of the Baldridge evaluation process, data malls, and all kinds of other things that we've done to rebuild an effective structure that looks very different than what one would look like in a manufacturing linear protocol and standard driven system. So I want to personalize this and I'll close and Craig will go next. The story of Frank. Frank is 87 years old. He has COPD, CHF, congestive heart failure, uh, uh, chronic uh, structural pulmonary disease, and diabetes. He's got bad lungs, bad heart, bad sugar. He's 87. He's widowed. He lives alone. He's lonely. He has a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, a nephrologist, a diabetologist, a neurologist, a primary care provider, home health, physical therapy, and probably about five other providers, each of whom are doing standards and protocols to optimize their little piece of the puzzle. And the person left making sense of all of this is Frank, who feels overwhelmed, alone, and lonely, and isn't doing too good, calls 911 all the time, has been to the emergency room 14 times in the last year and admitted to the hospital seven times. Anybody know any Franks? In your classic medical system, what goes on your clinical exam form that you get paid for is COPD, congestive heart failure, and diabetes. In our system, the South Central NUCA system of care, we would say Frank's primary medical clinical diagnoses we want to put on the form and get paid for are low self-esteem, low self-confidence, dependency, probably some depression, and just plain feeling of helplessness. And our core skill set we need to have is to address those issues and to partner with Frank around those issues. And then we have a chance of getting to the COPD, CHF, and that sort of thing. And it results in these kind of measurable outcomes at a population level when you do this for sustained time over a decade. Huge reduction in cost, dramatic improvement in outcomes, built on a completely different chassis and understanding of what the patient-centered medical home is about. At the end of the day, Frank should say this. They give me what I and my team have defined I need, when, where, and how I want it and need it in a safe, effective, and optimized way. They really know me and care about me. They listen to me, advise me, and support me on my journey. My questions and concerns are answered. My care is coordinated, and my values and goals are what drive my health plan. So as I turn it over to Craig for the next part, I hope you can kind of see how we sort of didn't do a whole lot to start with in our journey and the deep investment in our journey around just the fruit but really paid attention to what's the shared vision and goals we're trying to do. How do we do effective communication and deep conversations in a messy human environment in a complex adaptive system of care? Leadership becomes critical, and data is even more important 
in that kind of an environment than in a linear mechanical production-oriented type of environment. You may ask yourselves, how does this apply in Rhode Island? And that's what we're actually going to ask you when you break into your groups to think about and wrestle with. The people who are direct care providers in patient-centered medical homes, the doctors and nurses and PAs and MPs and so forth, are saying, well, gee, I can't do all this stuff in the investment realm with the soil and the environment, and how am I going to do that in my little practice? Well, I think there are people in the room who have the money and the power and the control over other parts of the system who actually could pay attention to some of that and build an environment within which then the individuals who need to be working on the specific fruit pieces can have the soil and the environment that makes it possible to pull that off. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig, who will help let you hear another story of a place that did some very um, uh, intentional investment into the soil and the environment around the people producing the fruit. And, and just, just as, uh, as Craig's coming up, if there's one or two clarifying questions uh, for Donna. We're on a timeline. I know. We are on a timeline. We changed the timeline a little. Yeah. We were beat up. Say our time. That's right. Turn, 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 turn. All right, I'll talk really fast. Um, so loneliness, right? Frank has loneliness. What yes. do you do with, what do I do with my folks who are lonely? Yeah. And you, because Yeah. Well, so do you think, what, what are you? You're a nurse, a doctor? A, yeah. So do you think you're the right person really to solve that problem? Probably not. So this comes to the big conversation we had, which is P, big P, big C, primary care versus small P, small C, primary care. And if we try and solve all of Frank's problems just through classic big P, big C, primary care, it ain't going to work we got to get to small p, small c primary care, whereby it becomes a fabric in the society in which we live, in which we provide medical services on the backbone of already existing other infrastructure in our communities and other things like that. For us, as a healthcare system, we have invested pretty significantly in something called elder services, which essentially is elder day care. And Frank, there is a real Frank, spends a good deal of his time actually doing volunteer work now throughout the system and connecting with and through the elder services programs which we created because it helps keep Frank out of our very expensive emergency room and hospital. Okay, so without further ado, for a round of applause. <laughs> From our almost neighboring state of Vermont, Dr. <laughs> Craig Jones. First off, um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here and Jeff and his team for organizing an incredible couple days thinking and talking through all the aspects of this. Um, I'm really just going to build off what Doug started and, frankly, your question, really, and, and talk more about the environmental factors because the idea that you have to set a standard to people, to doctors, and ask them to score themselves, and if they're a patient-centered medical home on paper, they get some kind of payment advantage. And that, that is a framework that's going in place all over the United States right now. And as we walk through these discussions, and frankly, many people are around the country, what became evident, that, as Doug said, is we need to really emphasize what are the other components that need to be there. And Doug highlighted the soil, preparing things the shared vision, the goals, the leadership. Also, changing the environment. So when you ask a question about how can you possibly have time or do what needs to be done for your patients, the counseling, it's, it's right at the heart of the issue. And the answer isn't just to rearrange the payment structure or the billing codes and maybe give you 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. That really isn't the answer. So let's build off what Doug said and talk about building the environment in which a medical home can be woven into the fabric of community, and in, in, in our case, we're calling it community systems of health. So, you know, the soil in Vermont's case, really, we're small enough, like you, actually, we share a lot of characteristics, and I've had so much opportunity to work with Chris Kohler and, and Deidre over the last few years, and um, the same visions, the same insights, and I've stolen every possible idea from Chris that I can. So you may have already heard almost everything you're going you're gonna to hear right now. Um, our vision, our leadership came from our legislature, from the governor, from the hospitals, from the insurers, from the clinicians. We're small enough that you could organize that conversation 
to really begin to build a vision. And there's guiding legislation, and then the commitment of the governor and the legislature to stick through it. Political time cycles, every two years. Change the world time cycle, much longer. And you, what we really needed was the political will to live through a change the world time cycle. And that leadership, the vision, um, is critical. But how does that translate into changing the environment so you really do have a different work environment for your medical home? So let me just highlight for a moment what the components of the, um, the model are in Vermont's Blueprint for Health. And we're really just the beginnings of Vermont's health care reform. We're sort of viewed as a foundation. Um, the vision is that you don't just have a primary care practice in isolation operating on its own. And you see on the right side, the vision in this model is that there are collections of advanced primary care practices or medical homes. They have been scored. They have achieved standards of better access, better communication, coordination of services, the use of electronic health systems, you know, the NCQA criteria, qualifying, recognizing as a medical home. But that's just the beginning. Um, in our case, that's rewarded with a payment reform for achieving those qualities. All the insurers pay the practices a per person per month payment based on how high you score as a patient-centered medical home. But that's just the beginning. In our case, the insurers also pay to build in the supports that you need to do the types of things that Doug was talking about and, again, that your question went to. So all in our insurers share the costs of what we call community health teams. And what's the idea here? That a Frank or any other patient um, can have access to the support, multidisciplinary support people they need, but have access to them really in the context of their medical home. So the insurers bring money into an administrative entity in each of our areas of the state, the community, the clinicians, the primary care practices, the hospital administrators and leadership, um, non-medical services in the community get together, form these planning groups, and they design their community health teams. What's it going to be? Social workers, dietitians, counselors, health educators, and they use that money to hire these teams. And the idea is they're a utility. They're there. There's no barriers. There's no copays. There's no prior offs. They work each day in different practices, and the size of the team grows based on the population of the medical homes they serve. So effectively creating a utility of support services so that a Frank can see the person that can help them with their um, counseling and maybe their depression and other issues right in their medical home. So that's the nature of the model in one aspect, and the payment reforms are designed directly to support it. And then if you really pay attention to the other side of the slide, this is where we're getting to the heart of it. There exists all these support services in communities. There are mental health um, services and designated agencies for people with disabilities. There are heating oil assistance, WIC, all kinds of other support services. How often and how well are those really connected to what you do in your primary care practice? Not very. Most people, as was the description with Frank, have to find their way, navigate their way. And one of the amazing things is taking a person who's depressed and feels helpless and is out of touch with life, and you hand them a phone number of who to call so they can get a little counseling and ask them to walk out and do it on their own. It's a recipe for not being able to succeed. So the idea is to build in the middle the support services so that you can truly have a continuum of, ser of health and human services. And it starts and is based in the medical home, but it's not limited there. And people can enter this from any direction. So a mother, and this has happened, who walks into the local district public health office have, trying to get WIC and, and support for the, uh, her children, uh, they ask and assess whether they have a medical home and community and uh, primary care for, for their family, and if they don't, they can get them connected to the nurse coordinator and the community health team and try and begin to get them into good primary care. Any door, the idea is to build a utility where families and patients can come through any door because you've organized a community to work together. So that's the intent. That's the vision of the model. Um, it's scripted. When we talk about the soil, it's in legislation, it's in policy. Insurers have been brought in to engage in the payment reforms to support it. The leadership is stuck with it. But what's really critical is to build the environment where it can come alive and it can work. And so that involves 
helping the practices become medical homes, it's a lot of work for a practice, busy practice, people don't have time to organize themselves to be a patient-centered medical home. How are you going to do that? It's an incredible amount of work to set up a community health team, the scheduling and the coordination to support practices. What about the health information infrastructure so that people's health information, I'm not just health care, their, their health, their social needs, their other needs, it can be where it needs to be. How about the evaluation system so that the data that Doug called for is really available when you need it? How do you build that data infrastructure? And most importantly, how do you turn it into knowledge? And what is going to take that knowledge and work with practices and community health teams and others to continuously improve? Who, how do you create that environment? So in our case, it was, it's really the state that put the blueprint in place as that guiding, supposedly trusted entity. And that's, of course, questionable since we're the big bad state. But the truth is somebody has to take that leadership role and has to be able to guide the process. In our case, it happens to be the, the state. But let's talk more about changing the environment. So just some tangible things, some pragmatic things. How do you really do this? So in our case, we use our budget, the blueprint budget, to help practices get ready and communities set up to operate this way. The first thing we do is establish blueprint grants to each community, um, identify an administrative entity, could be a hospital, could be an FQHC, it could be in one, some cases it's a designated agency, a mental health en en entity, and the grants go to that entity and they, we support project management and we support the time and materials they need to help begin to organize this in each of the 14 areas of the state. Um, one of the key things they do is set up the community work groups. That's all of you, the clinicians, the staff, the hospitals, non-medical services, to begin to meet regularly and plan through how can they work together, what's the staffing mix they're going to need on their community health teams, what do they have, what don't they have, to begin to work together and how they're going to implement the IT work and we have them working with our health information exchange and other um, support system. But those community work groups are critical. You need time, commitment, and leadership to get those in place. Um, we invest in a team of facilitators, practice facilitators that can work around the state. As a practice says, I want to do this, they begin to work with them, go through the analysis, the baseline assessments. What is it you need to do to become a medical home and operate and help them prepare for scoring and recognition. And then um, in addition to that, we have a team based at the University of Vermont that actually goes in and scores each practice, and we pay them to do that. It's part of our evaluation component. So that for the insurers, for the employers, for everybody, for the practices, there's a trusted, clear, objective assessment of the quality and the operations that are going in place. Accountability. The IT infrastructure, this is one of the toughest aspects trying to get crazy electronic medical record systems to even begin to transmit information and talk to each other, move information into a central registry so that those community health teams have an integrated health record. Let's say you're a nurse coordinator, a social worker, or a counselor. You're supporting three or four different practices. Somebody sees the list of people that Doug highlighted for Frank. Where is it that information comes together in an integrated health record for Frank? So the investment for state and federal dollars of building that health information infrastructure. One of the toughest aspects of this. An evaluation infrastructure with an all-payer claims database, a central clinical registry, and a number of other aspects so that we can not only begin to collect data in a, in a, in a meaningful way, but then the next line, begin the reporting platforms, turn it into knowledge, practice level reports, service area level reports, the types of meaningful snapshots so that practices and others can use that with coaches, with facilitators, and really move toward becoming a learning health system. They meet regularly as community health team members. They meet every month in most places just to focus on quality improvement. They meet weekly for clinical operations. In practices, many of them form quality improvement teams. They look at the snapshots, work with the facilitators. They're shared learning collaboratives. This is not mature, it's beginning to take shape, it's growing in some areas of the state more than others, but the point is moving toward a learning health system. That can't happen without the resources and the investment. You can't just send a check to a practice and say be a medical home and expect a community of health services to um, emerge. So these are just examples of all that goes into the preparation, the changing of the environment 
once you have the shared leadership and vision. Now, the interesting thing is once you reach that magic pivot point where practices get recognized as medical homes and now they're starting to receive the payment reforms, most of them applaud, they're thrilled, they've gone through a lot to get there. And the truth is that's just the beginning. Then they begin to work with these community health team members. They become embedded in the practice. These are new people, the social workers, the counselors. They begin to meet as a community on a more regular basis. And what really starts there is the beginning of a cultural change. And this has been fascinating to us. Over the course of a year, at first it's all the problems. We can't do this, we can't do that, we're too busy. Who's going to do this in our practice? There's all the list of problems that we all know. And after about a year, there's a different conversation. They're talking about how they're coordinating, how they're going to solve Frank's problems, how they're going to extend and get um, connected to long-term care, how they're going to begin to work on cancer prevention. They're talking proactively about changing what's going on in the community. And that varies around the state. Places that have been operating longer, you see it, you hear it. It's a different tone, and it's fascinating to watch. It's truly a cultural evolution. And we're trying to figure out how to understand that, because that may be the most important aspect. That may be real transformation. Um, the learning health system activities, the shared learning collaboratives, the work with the facilitators and coaches continues on. And simple little payment reforms. Payment to the practice for being a medical home, shared costs for the community health teams, those are now being built off, looked at as a foundation to build from, and there's a lot of work going on with our Green Mountain Care Board on looking at the next step of payment reforms to help accelerate primary care even more. Give you a concrete example. Primary care practices said the new NCQA standards are too hard. We can't demonstrate panel management. We can't do three months of population outreach. We don't have enough people. And the community health teams aren't being paid for until you start. We just finished a series of negotiations with our insurers. They're now going to front load the community health teams for primary care practices while they're preparing to become medical homes. So they can start doing outreach. They can get ready to be a medical home. They can do the outreach and start demonstrating it. And so in that way, investing. The insurers are willing to invest because they realize this is such a critical step. So I'm just trying to highlight various aspects of how you need to build the environment. And that's what's been missing in uh, many different models um, that are going into place around the country. But to watch the cultural transformation is really interesting, and, and I think that's one of the fruits, maybe, of the labor. Um, as of January, this is just an example. The red dots are where you have recognized medical homes and community health teams operating around the state. At that time, there were about 79 more practices. We're up to about 90 right now. And over half the state is probably exposed to the environment of a medical home and a community health team, but it varies. In St. Johnsbury, very mature. You should hear the conversations. The insurers are paying for, you know, maybe 10, 12 people that are community health team members. There's 30 or 40 that gather every month to talk about how they're going to coordinate services. The AAAs, the different organizations in the communities, gather with them now. Burlington, the same thing. Bennington, incredible mental health integration. They've done fantastic things. And it's really, it's really interesting to watch. In other communities, not as mature, but growing. And you have to live through that transition and be willing to invest in it. Let me close out really quickly with a discussion about why. Why is it that insurers are going to invest in this? Why is it that a state would invest in, through the blueprint budget in building this environment? We worked very hard to build projection models that said if we invest, we looked at all the health care expenditures as they are, projected what they're going to be, looked at the investments for the medical home, community health team payments, and other thing, aspects of this, and made series of projections over time and this just happens to be an example of one that now is real instead of projected. This is the annual change in health care dollars. The blue line is what was projected to happen. It's going down. The, the rate at which health care expenditures are growing is slowing down. So instead of growing at $70 million, it's now down around, I guess that's 40 or something million dollars. And it was projected to do that. It's slowing down but still growing too fast. The actual expenditures went up in the, in the communities with the initial investments, and now we're beginning to see them drop. And this is associated with reductions in hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and other things. 
We can't attribute this all to the blueprint. There's too many business layers between good care and what gets paid out. But it's following a trend. And what we're seeing in the communities that have been operating for a couple of years is a real rapid reduction in the growth of inpatient admissions and ED visits. And we're seeing other changes uh, that, uh, along those lines, just as Doug was talking about. But one of the key points here is, how do you get your hospitals involved? The whole business case model is made based on revenue decreasing for inpatient visits and, hospital, and ED visits. And what our hospitals did, they're in the planning process with us, they're part of this in each community. They realize there's going to be a reduction. But they also, through the course of discussion, preparing the soil, the communication, the work with us, realize this is going to happen one way or the other. There's going to be a change. And they were willing to engage in being a proactive part of this. And we actually got all 13 of our hospital CEOs to sign off and support the blueprint model uh, going in place even before the pilot started. But they also realized something else. Most of them, in one way or another, are subsidizing primary care right now. Cardiologists are having to do a lot of things in order to be able to support primary care. And here we are shifting the investment in primary care, and they realize that over time this is a help to them because they don't have to subsidize primary care as much. There's a lot of other things they have to do to adjust to this new environment, but there's a lot of things they can do. There's staffing, dynamic staffing models that allow them to actually have a wider margin even though their health care costs, the expenditures in their hospitals go down. There's a lot of models emerging around the country what hospitals can do. And so I would say one of the key aspects in building this environment is getting the hospitals engaged and working through what the strategies are so they can shift their business uh, models over the next five years or so. It's a key aspect to it. So let me close out there and again thank you for the opportunity. I just there's a lot on this that went into this tree. It really does highlight it. And we've always paid attention to the fruit, not to preparing the soil, the vision, the leadership. In our case, it's the state. And building that infrastructure on the left-hand side, changing the environment. Critical steps in, in medical homeness. And again, I want to thank you for the opportunity. That's a, a fantastic question, and it is, I didn't address it in the interest of time. We're just, we are at the front edge of that. You're right. It gets marginalized in many cases. Um, so one way is that the community health teams are focused on transitions of care. Most of it started just because of the nature of things with the traditional hospital and ED visit transition back to primary care. But in those places that are more mature and they've grown their community health teams, they are really starting to look at how to affect better transitions between long-term care sites and home. But more importantly, when we, and I know you have a multi-payer advanced primary care demonstration here in Rhode Island with Medicare. Uh, when we went into Medicare, we asked them to not only pay for medical homes and community health teams, we also asked Medicare to pay for what we call SASH teams, support and services at home. So these are teams of people based in publicly subsidized housing around the state, and this is just rolling out. And their sole focus is really knocking on the doors of high-risk seniors. And they do safety assessments. They help them with activities of daily living. And so we're putting in place, as extensions of the community health team, supports that can really help protect high-risk seniors in their home. And that's a concrete step at really helping try and, and improve that. One other step on the, on the IT, the health information infrastructure build out. Um, in fact, last Friday, we got it to where those SASH teams sitting in homes of high risk seniors are able to begin recording their safety assessments and other information. It's going back into the central registry. They and the community health teams can begin to work together. That's a critical step. Another is we've asked nursing, facility, nursing care facilities. We've, they've been given grants in our health IT infrastructure coming out of state and federal dollars to begin exploring how to connect their systems in 
with those of the community health team and the health information exchange. So we're at the front edge of it. You're at, that, that's one of the most critical aspects, along with mental health and addiction disorders and several other areas, where we're really trying to work on building, weave that into this fabric. And those are some examples of how we're doing it. Sure. So thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, we want to introduce Paul Grundy, who I think all of you know. His bio is in the information. He is a citizen of Rhode Island, born here, a citizen of uh, New York, and a citizen of the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be back with you. Um, I had the privilege of listening um, and hearing intently the hearing last week. Is Al here from Coastal? Anybody here from Coastal? Um, of the testimony that that occurred at the committee from Senate Help um, with uh, Senator, your Senator Whitehouse leading that conversation. I'm so proud of you guys. You've made so much progress. Um, thank you for all you've done. It's awesome. Um, Frank. I've met a Frank in Arusta County, Maine, uh, just like the Frank described in uh, Alaska. And I've met a Frank in Bend, Oregon, both in their 80s. Both of them are part of that community health team just described um, by Vermont. They, 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 they are volunteers supporting seniors at home as seniors themselves. It gives them a purpose. It gives them a value. There was a PBS special about it uh, around the one in Maine. It's awesome. And 1.9 cents out of every sick care dollar that, that we spend in Vermont goes to help support and sustain this community health effort where there's an integration, um, as the dean talked about earlier, of primary care and public health. And what happens to my employees in those environments is that when my new employees are, are diagnosed with diabetes, um, the community health coordinator meets them on a Tuesday morning, <laughs> in Burlington anyway, and organizes them to go hike through the grocery store with, with other newly diagnosed diabetics. And then they go out to the rail trail. And, 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 a, and as a group of diabetics who belong to a hiking club, they're introduced into that sort of a milieu and conversation. And, and, and why is all this important to you? The number that I put up here is the reason why you need to look at this. This is my cost in Vermont versus my cost in Rhode Island. If you guys don't come to grips with this, you're screwed. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, it's you know, we, we had this conversation with all the national governors, um, you know, hosted by Governor Douglas of Vermont, my CEO, our leadership went and spoke to all the governors and said, hear the sucking sound, it's your jobs. I mean, health care is so expensive, it's really important that you focus on this and you begin to get a grips of this as a state, um, and, and, and you are, which is really, really, really encouraging. So the, the testimony, if you haven't seen it, you should. You can just Google my Facebook page. I post all that stuff out there. Um, also, the uh, primary care article that Governor, I mean, that Dean... Um, um, Wing uh, put out there is also posted on my Facebook. It's very cool uh, what you guys are doing. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about a specific case example, um, and that is the hospital as an employer. And we happen to have um, HealthSpan uh, in the room, um, and my colleague who, who does benefit design uh, for for HealthSpan uh, is here as well. Um, and I would really like to encourage you to look at about 100 examples that are going around the country now where, where the hospital, as an employer, begins to step up to the concept of the medical home for its own employees. It's the one place in the system where the direction of the money is in the right direction for the hospital. Because, you know, when you're dealing with a hospital as an employer, it's their money, right? So the payment and the re redesign of the practice are all aligned. So York Hospital um, in Pennsylvania is, is one I would encourage you to visit. I would encourage you to bring them up and look at that. 
and their example, again, there, there's, hundred, there's 100 of them so, or so around the country where they've really fundamentally looked at benefit redesign, practice redesign, and payment redesign all in the scope of their own control with their own employees and then sold that to other employers. Two weeks ago, York just sold their medical home concept to the state of Pennsylvania as an employer. I mean, I mean that's hospital that's going to survive in, in, in a world where there's going to be a decrease in the need for hospital beds, right? So, I mean, I would think it would be in your interest to really fundamentally begin to look at that as a model. When I look at what's really driving change here and who's kind of on board and not on board, I would really encourage the hospitals here to get on board. And this is a good way to really start to get on board. Here's the trend line, by the way, for us um, in Vermont, for our employees in Vermont, when they're in a medical home environment, is down 11%. Down 11%. So this is another example. This happens to be the University of Utah, Care by Design. They're in their 10th year now as a medical home. Um, they, they took their own employees. This is their trend line for their own employees. This is such a powerful trend line that they sold this to Rio Tinto and they sold it to the Mormon church as an employer. I mean, that's the kind of differentiation we're seeing around the country. Bellin Hospital, Green Bay, Wisconsin, same thing. You know, re really fundamentally redesigning based on their own employee experience and beginning to take cost out, beginning to attract employers into your community because you've taken cost out. Believe me, anybody here from a health care plan? You can raise your hands. I'm, I'm friendly to you. So, so you know, the health care plans, by and large, are on board this and really driving it. That was the message that Al gave to, to the Senate Health Committee uh, uh, a few days ago. Um, and and it's, it's, it's very exciting. The world is really beginning to change. Um, so this is a stick of dynamite, uh, in case anybody doesn't recognize it. What's under the dynamite is, is the carrier letter from this year from the single largest employer in our nation, which is the federal government. You can Google it. It's, a, it's publicly available. It's, it's out there. Um, this carrier letter says that we as an employer want to buy medical home level care for our employees. And that's the conversation between a, an employer and a plan, right? The last time I was here, I was in the rotunda um, invited by the governor. And I stood up here and I said, if, if you as an employer are not getting this kind of capacity from the health care plan that you have now, fire them. They listened, by the way, and they're really stepping up to this. Uh, and so that's very exciting. But on top of this letter, this language, 47 of the Fortune 100 took this language and every day for about a month, every national plan in the country got a FedEx letter with the same language in it. That's the buyer speaking, right? You know, we, we want a different, we want, we, we, we now have our CFOs in the room every time we do our benefit redesign and there's a conversation between us and the plan. Because that's our second largest cost. So back to the environment, the soil, and the fruit. I would really encourage Rhode Island as, as a state that's near and dear to me um, to, to look around a little bit at what's going on. I would encourage you to look at what's happening in Vermont. I would encourage you to do a field trip to Vermont with some of the guys that are driving this. I mean, they've really integrated government. They've really integrated the employers. They've really integrated hospitals. Um, and they've pulled together the ability to write legislation around those issues. 1.9 cents out of every sick care dollars goes to sustain that interface between public health, health care, and sick care. Awesome. I would encourage you to look at experiences like Colorado. 
Um, Colorado, without having government support, has actually coalesced a functioning working group that meets and was able to convene itself in a way that supported attracting the comprehensive primary care initiative of CMMI. Um, and, and in a contentious environment, they pretty, pretty much have agreement. Particularly one community, Grand Junction, is really worth looking at um, because they've really transformed in, in that environment without state support how that environment works. I think it's really, really worth looking at the lesson that you heard uh, from Alaska. I, I think there's probably no community that's further ahead with more experience. And I think it's really worth looking um, at a couple of the CPCI states that were just comprehensive primary care initiative is the new pilot that's been rolled out by CMS. One is Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is really worth looking at in terms of how they've redesigned their whole educational experience to drive this. Um, so I, I will leave that, and I think we have some time for questions, or are we going to move on? One question. One question from the audience is what we have time for. So Frank, all over the country in various places, is now functioning. It's very cool. <laughs> functioning in terms of actually providing support for people who are seniors just like Frank, but, but, but happen to be on that given day more vulnerable than, than, than Frank is. It gives Frank a purpose in life, and it also, it also provides health care. I've seen that now in New Zealand and in Denmark and in at least a half a dozen places around the United States. One more Frank question. So there's actually a very good article written um, in the Journal of the American Family Medicine Association. It, it's, it, it came out comparing eight primary care states. It was Sibelius had done this, uh, uh, cr created a little subgroup to look at the experience across eight countries. It was reported. Um, one of the authors is um, from the Graham Center, Bob Phillips. If you Google Bob Phillips primary care, I think it'll pop up. Um, I have quite a bit of experience looking globally. I spent a lot of time in Denmark. We've gone from 157 hospitals in Denmark to 21. Ambulatory sensitive conditions are actually can be handled in an ambulatory environment. And by the way, all the Franks in Denmark are, are part of community health support matrix where they support each other at the community level at a very high level. So most most of the Franks in Denmark would actually be housed by a Frank in Denmark when they needed care beyond their own capacity at home versus going to a hospice or, or, or a hospital. And it gives a purpose for the other Franks. It's awesome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to thank our presenters and all the people who participated in the think tank because they really helped to hone the presentations, build the model, uh, and the three people who were willing to stand up and talk had to go the gauntlet of uh, criticism and critique and additions.